Hi students, welcome to Marketing uh, 3336. Uh, this is the lecture for Principles of Marketing, uh, Chapter 2. Uh, this uh, purpose of this lecture is to go over material from Chapter 2 that's titled uh, Company and Marketing Strategy. Uh, this is out of our textbook of the 18th edition of Principles of Marketing, Partnering to Build Customer Engagement, Value, and Relationships is the title. So, um, Really looking forward to talking to you about the material today. Uh, I think it's a very important material for us to get foundational things. Again, uh, last chapter we talked a lot about uh, value and uh, the evolution of marketing in general. And today we're going to really be talking and focusing on the company and the strategy that the company does with regard to marketing and how they set an overarching corporate strategy regarding marketing. So let's get let's start off with an example that our uh, that our book provides, and I'd like to enhance our our discussion on this particular example. So this is uh, this is thinking about Nike, um, and and Nike's customer value message as well as their brand engagement and community. And let me first talk a little bit about brand engagement. So the idea uh, that brands have evolved into over time is really to be able to form what we call uh, brand identification. And what brand identification is, is when the brand itself uh, starts to have a meaning beyond just what it represents with regard to its function, but also with uh, societal and uh, personal values and norms. So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, Nike's done a lot of social awareness and social uh, advertising, as well as uh, funding and uh, in working with a lot of not-for-profits and uh, trying to really represent a larger uh, community and brand uh, recognition with its consumers. So the idea really is, is to be able to uh, tie uh, the values of Nike to the values of the individual. So organizational identification or brand identification is when an individual's, uh, how they identify themselves overlaps with how that brand uh, or how that company defines themselves. So the extent to which that overlap takes place is what we call identification. And, it, and many uh, firms are really trying to achieve that now to be able to have a real tie with their community and uh, build what we call brand engagement. Nike is one example of this. So I want to move forward, and, and one of the things I want to really talk about is, is uh, a little bit about this concept of creating value, and I think it's really fascinating. There was a really interesting interview that got done with uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and it was one of the first interviews that, that brought them together to talk about the evolution of their firms, about how they started, about how they created value, and it asked each of them to reflect on the other one's value that uh, they perceived their firm brought to the marketplace. So uh, I want you to hear this because these are two of the most successful tech giants uh, in the world, and uh, obviously we think of uh, Steve uh, Jobs as a person who really was a master of the area of marketing and entrepreneurship, and Bill Gates is clearly a person who uh, has worked on marketing as well as innovation across both of them. So let's hear a little clip about them and, and about their stories and, uh, and reflect on that for a minute. Um, so let's get started. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, there's been a lot of like mano a mano catfight kind of thing in a lot of the blogs and the press and stuff like that. And we wanted to, the first question I Kelly was interested in asking is what you think each has contributed to the computer and technology industry, starting with you, Steve, for Bill, and vice versa. Um, <laughs> well, you know, Bill built the first software company in the industry. And... Uh, I think he built the first software company before anybody really in our industry knew what a software company was, except for these guys. And that was huge. That was really huge. And the business model that they ended up pursuing turned out to be the one that worked really well, you know, for the industry. Mm -hmm. So I think, but the, the, the biggest thing was Bill was really focused on software before almost anybody else had a clue that, that it was really the software. That's, that's what I see. I mean, I, a lot of other things you could say, but that's the high order bit. And I think building a company is really hard. And, and it, requires, it requires your 
greatest persuasive abilities to hire the best people you can and keep them, keep them, keep them at your company and keep them working, you know, doing the best work of their lives, hopefully. And uh, Bill's been able to stay with it for all these years. So, Bill, how about the contribution of Steve and Apple? Well, first I want to clarify, I'm not fake Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what Steve's done is quite phenomenal. You know, if you look back to 1977, that Apple II computer, the idea that it would be a mass market machine, uh, you know, the bet that was made there by Apple uniquely, there were other people with products, but the idea that this could be an incredible empowering phenomena. Apple pursued that dream. Uh, you know, then uh, one of the most fun things we did together was the Macintosh, and that was so risky. And you know, people may not remember that Apple really bet the company. Mm -hmm. Lisa hadn't done that well, and uh, you know, some people were saying, "Okay, that general approach wasn't good." But the team that Steve built, even within the company, to pursue that. Uh, even some days it felt a little ahead of its time. Uh, yeah, I don't remember that Twiggy disk drive. And, 128K. Yeah. Uh, and... Ah, uh, the Twiggy disk drive, <laughs> yes. Uh, Steve gave a speech once, which is one of my favorites, where he talked about, in, in a certain sense, we build the products that we want to use ourselves. Uh, and, you know, so he's really pursued that with incredible taste and elegance that has had a, a huge impact on the industry uh, and his ability to always come around and figure out where that next bet should be uh, has been phenomenal. You know, Apple literally was failing when Steve went back and uh, reinfused the uh, innovation and risk taking that have uh, been phenomenal. So the industry's benefited immensely. Uh, from his his work, we've both been lucky to be part of it. But uh, you know, I'd say he's contributed as much as anyone. Um, well, we've also we've yeah, also both been incredibly lucky to have had great partners that we started the companies with, and we've attracted great people. I mean, so everything that's been done at Microsoft and at Apple has been done by just remarkable people. Uh, none of which are sitting up here, you know. Okay, so you got a chance to be able to see a little bit of information about how they define the contributions of their organizations with regard to, uh, to bringing value to the market. And I thought one of the really interesting things is that uh, you had uh, Gates reflecting on how Jobs talked about how he really was in touch with the, the consumer or the end user to be in, in the sense that he built products or software that he thought that others would find valuable to use because he found it valuable. So he really wanted to be in touch with that user and really understand what that person was needing or valuing in the marketplace. And that's what we get at in this idea of customer value. Um, and, and, and I'd like to, I'd like us to think a little bit about how companies strategically think about building and generating value and the marketing functions strategically across the firm. So let's start off with a large definition. So many of us have probably thought about marketing a very micro phenomena, but let's think of it from a macro perspective. So strategic planning is the process of developing and maintaining a strategic fit between the organization's goals and capabilities and its changing marketing opportunities. So what this really says is that part of the entire process that the leadership team takes in an organization, that is the CEO, the C-suite, the board of directors, everybody down to the marketing delivery individuals in the organization, think about how their overall planning as an organization, how the consumer, how marketing, how to deliver value, and it fits across the entire phenomena. And we think of that as part of the strategic planning process. So strategic planning is how the firm thinks about their strategy moving forward and where marketing uh, particularly fits within, to that, within that strategy. So I'd like to, to move forward on that a bit. And, and think about the highest order of the way we think about marketing. And, that, and that's what we call uh, our uh, company-wide strategic planning mission, or in this case, we, we define it as a marketing-oriented mission. So 
All firms develop mission statements. This is a standard process that a company uses to be able to state what is the mission of our company, the overall mission of a company. So on the right here, we see IBM. And on the example of IBM to the right, we see that the mission that IBM says is let's build a smarter planet. That's their overall mission statement. So the mission statement is the organization's purpose, what it wants to accomplish in its larger environment. So a, a few things that a mission statement typically uh, states, and first of all, it has an overarching statement and then usually sub-statements. And what you see here in this Smarter Planet statement is it bridges to smarter analytics, uh, IBM's mobile first, social business, and IBM's smart cloud. All of those will have vision or mission statements in the sub-development of these strategic areas, but they tie into that overarching strategic value of let's build a smarter planet. So when we think about this, uh, when we're forging a mission statement, a firm asks a few different questions. The first is, what is our business overall? What, 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 what are we doing and what, how do we define who we are? Who is our customer? When we think about who ultimately is, uh, are the individuals that buy from us and then, and then who consumes the product at the end? Remember this definition or distinction between customer and consumer. A customer could buy down the chain of supply, but a consumer is the ultimate one who uses or benefits from that product or service. So what do our consumers value uh, and, and what should our business be overall? These are some very important questions that we ask to be able to help build what we call a marketing oriented mission. And so we wanna be able to understand that a mission statement is and how to make it market oriented. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about things uh, with regard to market orientation uh, this semester and the, the impact of being market oriented on firm success. So when we're, we're thinking about setting a company-wide strategic plan, there's going to be what we call the business objectives, which are the larger objectives of the organization as a business overall that affects all the functional areas of the organization. And then that, that's going to translate into tactical, what we call marketing objectives that are specifically for the marketing area. Pretty much any firm is broken into divisional focal area for across the firm. So for example, you'll have a finance function, an accounting function, an operations function, an IT function, a marketing function. All of these different functional areas coordinate with one another uh, across what we call business objectives. So, so if we think about a firm's business objectives, a few of those areas that we think about are building profitable customer relationships, that's one, um, invest in research to be able to understand and drive our business objectives, and then improve profitability for the organization. Those are typical business objectives. So the question would be is how do those translate into objectives that marketing will then use? Because these business objectives drive us to think about what are our marketing objectives within our organization. So building profitable customer relationships. What we might want to do is we might want to increase our market share. What does that mean? That's the percentage of the business that we uh, own across all of our customers. Do we own 20%, 30%, 50%, 70%? So try to increase the share of our customers. The next that marketing might do is to create loyal partnerships. And that is to make sure that the partners or our supply chain members, as well as our end consumers, like we talked about, are loyal. They come back and buy from us on a regular basis. So they have a lot of loyalty. So we're not having churn, what we call, where people leave and we have to create new relationships over time. So we bring in loyal uh, and profitable customers. And then lastly, marketing might have an objective of increasing promotion. And that would be to increase the awareness and, and visibility of our products, our brands, into the marketplace to help us achieve these. So this is our overall business objectives. And you can see how these might transfer into what we call our marketing objectives uh, down below. So uh, if we think about, this is a, an example of a company-wide strategic planning uh, objective. We see here an example of Heinz Ketchup. 
And this is Heinz overall vision to be the best food company growing a better world. And you can see their sub values. Uh, they're customer first, uh, uh, innovation, quality, integrity, uh, ownership. So being able to think about the value across that they bring to the marketplace and what are the values that they show as a firm. So this drives into Heinz's overall objective is to build profitable customer relationships by developing food superior in quality, taste, nutrition, and convenience that embraces its nutrition and wellness mission. So what this is the overarching statement and you can see where that might drive the mission uh, of, uh, of Heinz with regard to uh, the marketing specific functional uh, goals and objectives. So whenever we're uh, thinking about strategically designing or working with uh, the marketing function overall, one of the things that the firm thinks about from a strategic business planning perspective is what we call the business portfolio. Uh, this is a very important term for us to understand going forward in this semester because we'll be talking about terms like business portfolio and portfolio analysis many times when we move forward, whenever we talk about strategic level information in the class. So a business portfolio is the collection of business and products, businesses and products that make up the company. We're going to talk about portfolio analysis in a few minutes uh, using what we call the BCG matrix. Uh, our book talks quite a bit about that, but I want to give some examples of that. But when we think about things, we think about our, our business portfolio. So this is a, a company may have a collection of businesses, and that is they have different businesses within an overall overarching company. So I'll give you an example, Siemens Corporation. Siemens has a number of different divisions that have different types of business. So they have an energy business. So they work with, 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 uh, with corporations, with governments, with all kinds of entities to build power plants, energy grids, uh, energy solutions. And that may be one of their businesses. But they also have another business, which is what we call the consumer goods business, where they build toasters and telephones and other electrical equipment. Um, they also have another business, the healthcare business. And within the healthcare business, they, they do scanning machines. Uh, they, they do x-ray machines, uh, CT scans, uh, MRIs, all those kinds of medical equipment that many people use uh, within the medical industry. So they have different things within what we call our business portfolio. And within that, they have products that they represent across the organization as a whole. So one of the things that firms often do in this is they create what call they call a portfolio analysis. And this is when they actively analyze how are all these businesses doing across the organization? How are our products doing relative to each other? Where should we set our priorities for investing in these products and these services across the organization? And that translates down into the marketing strategies as well within the firm. So it's important for us to know this, what we call this portfolio analysis. And we're going to get into this in some more detail in this, in this lecture as well. So the first thing to understand is there's a, a business portfolio, which is a collection of businesses or collection of products that we have that we sell in the marketplace. And a portfolio analysis is where we analyze this strategically to determine what the emphasis or priority of how we invest in these various elements into the marketplace. So within any company, a company is broken into what we call strategic business units uh, within the company, and those are called SBUs. So an example of this, 3M Corporation, many of you know 3M because 3M uh, probably is very famous for a few things for you. Many of you have used the post-it notes from 3M, uh, the 3M ad, uh, sticking and adhesive uh, equipment, but 3M has a tremendous number of product offerings in the marketplace, multi-billion dollar company. And across 3M, they have more than 30 individual business units or divisions that work across 3M, and each of these divisions work separately across the organization to drive the success of overall of 3M. These divisions may actually sell different products uh, or services or even the same products or services across divisions, but they serve different customer bases. So I'll give you an example. There is one of the divisions that will serve uh, schools and, uh, and hospitals. 
you have another division that will serve IT sector, IT businesses. We have a, another division uh, that will specifically do governments or foreign entities, government practices. So there's all kinds of different divisions that will work to be able to sell to customers. And they have their own defined entity of what we call product lines that sell across these, uh, across these areas. So, so when we think about analyzing our business portfolio, the first thing that we do is we identify what strategic business units we want to be able to analyze. Our book does a very good job, if you're not following this, of understanding what an SBU is. I'd suggest you Google it or you look it up in your text. You really understand what the concept of strategic business unit is. So one of the things that we want to do in our portfolio analysis is assess the attractiveness of the various strategic business units. So if, if I'm at 3M, I look across my various divisions and I say, how important or attractive are each of these divisions? How profitable are they? How much revenue do they bring in? And, and what are the products that I can successfully launch or move in each of these areas? Where should I focus my investment or my resources? in these different divisional areas. So we assess the attractiveness of the various SBUs, and then we decide how to invest and support in them. So that's what we do in, in what we call our portfolio analysis. So I'm gonna introduce what we call the growth share matrix now. And the, the growth share matrix is something that's a, it's a very famous and very common form of analysis that's, that's been around, that's been uh, uh, it was introduced by the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, years ago, and it's still part of a very common way of organizations assessing what we call our business portfolio. So the growth share matrix is a portfolio planning method that evaluates a company's SBUs in terms of market growth rate, a relative market share. Those are the two dimensions. So let's look at it and see what I mean, what we mean by that and really try to understand this concept. I think this is going to be an important one for us all to understand moving forward. So if we look at the two dimensions here, the first dimension, which is right here, is, uh, is from low to high what we call market growth rate. So what does market growth rate mean? It means, does, is that market growing uh, rapidly? So is it an expanding market? Uh, is, it a, uh, is it a stable market or is it a shrinking market? Okay. So if the market growth rate is very high, uh, where people are buying more and more and more of something, there, there's, there's greater and greater demand over time for something, that would put it up here in, in this, this is what we call the high market growth rate. A low market growth rate is where something uh, is not, the market itself is, is stable. It's already hit its saturation. Uh, you're not gonna get a lot of growth in that marketplace. So a lot of times innovative products or innovation in a category uh, across things generates what we call a high market growth rate. So very innovative things drive market growth. However, there are other things that have been around for a long time that still have a lot of demand, uh, possibly, but have a low market growth rate. So if we think about the total market growth rate of things, we could have high or we could have low market growth. The next thing that we have, and it goes in this direction, you'll see from low to high, is relative market share. Now remember market share, so if we have a, a complete pie of everybody out there in the marketplace, and this is all the people who could potentially buy our products. So let's say um, uh, cell phones. This is the complete buy of everybody in the US that, that would potentially buy a cell phone. And the question is, is what percentage of the US um, buys our particular cell phone or that cell phone. And if we took this little piece of the pie and that piece of the pie represented, let's say, 20%, then our market share would be 20%. So we might want to contrast products with a low market share versus those with a very high market share. So if we took two products uh, in the cell phone market, one that only had a very small slice and that would be here, um, and let's just say that's 3% of the market, uh, versus one that had 20% of the market, that would be the difference between being in the low category and the high category. So higher market share products go over here, lower here. 
So if we're looking at the full BCG matrix, what we take is we take every product that's out there in the marketplace and we, uh, that we represent as a company, or we could do this at a division level or at a product level, and what we do is we plot those businesses, uh, we plot those businesses on this grid, and we put a dot on the grid for, uh, for where, uh, where we are with those businesses. So and I'm going to show you a little video here in a second that represents it, this in a little more uh, detail. And this is actually a video that was generated uh, by the Boston Consulting Group uh, that can discuss the actual BCG matrix, which I think you'll think is uh, useful to be able to understand this B BCG concept. And we'll, we'll revisit this in a minute as well after we see this video to really understand the concept of the, uh, the BCG uh, represents here. The Boston Consulting Group matrix is often used to determine where a business currently sits in relation to other business different quadrants mean. The dog quadrant means your business has a small share of a market which has a small growth and follows the idiom worked like a dog. It's difficult to argue for investing in something with minimal growth and as a result these businesses are often liquidated. Marks with analysis and the right investment, question marks could become cash cows or even stars. While the BCG matrix's nomenclature isn't exactly orthodox, the graph helps visualize various companies' performances and offers a sound starting point for analysis. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you because I think that was a, that's a good uh, example of, uh, of being able to really understand the uh, BCG concept. The Boston Consulting Group matrix is... So a couple of things that I want to mention about this BCG approach, there's a few downsides to the BCG approach that companies should consider. The first is the difficulty in defining what SBUs uh, and measuring what we call the, the share growth. So one thing is, we want to define how we divide our company up into pieces. So some companies, it's not so easy to divide the company's opportunities into individual pieces. It's probably the easiest when a company has, let's say, 10 or 15 products, and then they do it at the product level. But if we want to do it at a segment or market level, that becomes much more complicated. The other thing that's a lot more difficult is actually defining where growth is coming. So sometimes it's obvious to see that a market is growing. So I'll give you an, uh, an example of this. So, uh, um, for example, the online distribution of food, that market. So that market where people actually have food delivered to their homes in the United States, that market is obviously growing. People are increasing their demand for food delivery to their homes. Uh, and particularly under COVID, that's a growing marketplace. Uh, so that's an obvious growth point. You're seeing a surge in growth. But there are other, other situations where, we're, uh, where we have a marketplace where we're not really sure if it's going to grow. We believe it might grow, but we're not sure. We're not actually seeing this massive growth rate. So we have to be able to evaluate the potential for growth. The next is this type of uh, analysis can be quite time consuming. It often brings together a, a large group of individuals to debate these concepts and can be quite expensive to be able to bring the resources together to be able to understand what's happening. Um, it's also a focus on current business and not as much on future planning because it really doesn't let us think so much about the products and things that we're going to bring out in five years. It's mostly focuses on what we have now and what our portfolio of business is doing at this point in time. So this is, a, uh, this is an important thing for us to, to think about and, uh, and we should really think about understanding this concept well, okay? All right. So uh, next, I'd like to uh, I'd like to think about as we move from the BCG matrix. Hold on a second. I'd like to talk about the final element that we are going to talk about today, which is the marketing environment, and particularly this is a an area that I think we should start to know some definitions around is what is the total marketing environment and where does marketing fit within this total environment? So this is a figure that I want us all to become familiar with. 
uh, to, to be able to understand what are these elements that fit into what we call the marketing environment. And we need to know the definition of these de various elements. We've talked about many of these and our book goes through this, but we're going to be talking about each of these elements throughout the semester. So if we look at the center of any company, the center of any company is the customer value and relationships that we're trying to build. And here we talk about this segmentation, targeting, differentiation, and positioning. We talked about that yesterday, which is we divide our market into segments. We pick those segments the tar that we're going to target. We make sure that we're different from our competition, and then we position ourselves in the market relative to that. And then we consider all the levers that we have to pull as a marketing function. There are four levers that any marketing group has to pull. One is the product that they offer. What are the specifics of the, that product that we're bringing to market? The next is how we price that product. How much is it that we're selling it for? The promotion, what tools are we using to promote it? Are we using sales? Are we using advertising? What mechanisms are we using to promote? And then place, which is how are we distributing that product? So place is distribution. Are we going to go through stores? Are we going to distribute directly online? Are we going to distribute through uh, uh, intermediaries like uh, distribution companies? How are we going to bring our product to marketplace and make it available for people to purchase? So those are the four things. We're going to actually spend uh, at least a chapter or two on each of these concepts, but I'd like everybody to read through the book and understand product, price, promotion, and place. And then we're going to be thinking about the environment the external environment that influences all these decisions. We have who is our competition, um, how is that product brought to market, what are the major intermediaries, we talked about that last week, um, who are our suppliers that supply us our products that help us uh, generate that product to bring it to market, and our publics, uh, where are all the publics that affect that that product or that environment? What, what, what are all the elements of the externalities that could affect the way we sell to that marketplace?